Should we get started? Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our uh, discussion this afternoon. Uh, we'll be talking about contemporary human rights issues in times of war. Um, thank you all for coming. It's obviously uh, a very timely uh, and important discussion given all the events and going around the world and clearly by the really nice turnout. It's clearly a, an issue that's of interest to all of you as well. So we thank you for coming. Um, so yeah, so yeah, we're going to be talking today about uh, various human rights issues and uh, pressing human rights issues in, in times of conflict with a particular focus on the current situation in Israel and Palestine and the war in Gaza. And we have a number of very eminent and expert speakers on various aspects of the issues. So I won't, um, I want to uh, just, uh, without further ado, we'll hand it over to the speakers uh, without too much preamble, but just to give a rough idea of what the, what the afternoon will look like, we'll save, uh, we'll do uh, 10 minutes for each speaker, and then uh, we'll save the questions to the end so we can have about 20 minutes or so of uh, Q&A. So please save your uh, questions till the end, and, and then we'll, uh, uh, plan to wrap up by 4 p.m. sharp. That's all right. So we'll begin first with uh, Dr. Alice Panapento. Um, Alice, if you're ready, you can... Um... Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm reading Alice's message to myself. Um, Alice, whenever you're ready, you can turn on your camera and the floor is yours. Oh, one other thing. Um, I will give you guys, uh, Alice and uh, Tamara and Connell and Luke, I will give you guys a one minute warning um, just to keep everyone uh, roughly on track. So thanks a lot. Hi everyone. And thank you very much, Nikhil, for the kind uh, introduction and for everyone involved in uh, the organization today. Um, it's uh, great to have the opportunity to talk about this topic, uh, sadly in relation to uh, current events in the Middle East, which I think will be the focus of most of our interventions this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to share my screen um, so I can get my slides up. Let me see if we can do that. Um, great. Can you all see my screen? I hope so. Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Right. So I thought we would talk a little bit about human rights in Palestine between conflict and colonialism. Uh, the map you see on the right of the screen here is the UN partition plan of uh, 1947, and we'll return to this uh, in a moment. So the take home message of these 10 minutes um, is that Palestine has fallen through the cracks of the human rights project. The reasons for this are a combination of colonialism, conflict, and a total disregard of international law, as we shall see. Um, the story, however, is one that um, goes back to World War I and not World War II, as many might uh, commonly think. And we'll go into this in a few more um, minutes. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, today the international legal order is premised on the UN Charter and the range of provisions in that document that include a range of human rights um, provisions as well as um, human rights adjacent uh, provisions. Um, these um, include the right to self-determination in Article 1, and this is uh, particularly important in relation to um, the history of Palestine, the prohibition of conquest through the use of force, set out in Article 2. Uh, again, let's talk about the international legal order as it is today. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1947 um, provides that catalogue of fundamental provisions pertaining to human rights, um, which should orient um, our understanding of um, the situation in Palestine, not only today, but also historically. I'm sure everyone in the room and the virtual room knows that the Palestinian Nakba of 1948 displaced 
um, close to three quarters of a million Palestinians who were driven from their homes um, when the British um, mandate forces and administrators left what was historic Palestine and the um, Jewish armed groups uh, declared the independence of uh, Israel. And uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the conflict that um, resulted in the displacement of three quarters of a million Palestinians and set out um, the situation that we still see the consequences of today. As I said a moment ago, though, I don't want to talk about the world after 1945. I want to talk about the world before 1945. I think colleagues on the panel will cover um, the post 45, 48 period better than I will. So the denial of Palestinian human rights is due to a long chain of colonialism that um, in, a, in a sense uh, hands over uh, the spirit of denial of human rights um, that uh, characterizes uh, the situation for Palestinians throughout the last, well, over a hundred years. First Britain, then the League of Nations and UN, so the international community in its institutional form, and most recently post-1948 Israel. The realization of Palestinian human rights has been impeded by a range of actors, and we'll talk about uh, 1917 in a moment. The British mandate in Palestine, which was endorsed by the international community's institutions, set out a system of denial of human rights and social flourishing for Palestinians and privileged the Zionist movement's primacy in all aspects of life. The UN endorsed this and endorsed the partition plan that the British set out in the Peel Commission report of 1937, a great document if any of you are interested in um, the uh, unique genre of um, British colonial literature. Um, since 1948, as I mentioned earlier in relation to the Nakba, Israel has adopted as its official state policy the denial of Palestinian human rights, including the right to self-determination, again, which I mentioned earlier, enshrined in um, the UN Charter, and the right of return. So, why do I want to talk about the world before 1945? Well, because that's where it all started. That's where the um, the common position in the international community, especially in the Anglo community, um, was that Palestinian human rights could be violated, right, without too many th uh, consequences and without too much thought. There's a continuum from the Balfour Declaration to the present day in the Anglo support for the Zionist cause. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, historic Zionism. I use this term in a specific historic sense um, related to uh, the um, Zionist cause, which sought the establishment of a Jewish homeland in what was uh, historic Palestine. So again, let's look at colonialism, conflict, and the denial of human rights uh, taken as a uh, a continuum mm, from 1917, the height of World War I, when things were looking pretty bad for Britain and its allies. And it's in that context that Lord Balfour writes to a representative of the Jewish community uh, in Europe, who um, was promoting Zionist aspirations across not only Britain, but the continent. In the declaration, um, Lord Balfour uh, wrote relays that the government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use British best endeavors to facilitate that object. Um, as, as, a, as a, almost as an afterthought, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, i.e. 90 plus percent of the local uh, uh, inhabitants at that point who were of course Palestinian Arabs, both Christian, Muslim and non-religious. Um, and importantly, um, nothing shall be done that should compromise the rights and political status of Jews in any other country. This is quite remarkable. Um, if you look at my source of an uh, Israeli historian here, it's interesting to see how Balfour is described by uh, Zand as a Protestant colonialist who had uh, worked quite fearlessly uh, against Jewish uh, immigration in the UK, 
He was actively preventing uh, refugees fleeing pogroms in Eastern Europe, reaching um, Britain. Um, so we're not talking about a visionary. We're talking about someone who was essentially trying to control the population of Britain at the time, um, and who was quite hostile, actually, to minorities. The mindset of the Balfour Declaration is quite obvious. Um, my sources are uh, historians here. One calls it arrogant, dismissive and racist. The other um, historian talks about how European Jews were viewed as carriers and transmitters of that civilizing mission of Europe to the quote unquote backward Orient. And there's a subtext there that I think remains for the present day in how we see Palestinians um, depicted in uh, the media right now, and how Palestinian human rights are somehow not as valuable as the human rights of um, uh, others in uh, the region and uh, elsewhere. The Balfour Declaration, let's remember, was issued at a time when Britain was not controlling Palestine. Um, that being said, it was approved in advance by the US, uh, endorsed afterwards by France and Italy. Um, and it's interesting because in the Peel Commission report, uh, the Prime Minister at the time, Lloyd George, um, described the document as a propaganda, as a piece of propaganda. Mm. It was at a time when Britain uh, had suffered major defeats in World War One, and um, Lloyd George and his government were hoping to um, gain the support of American Jews. And that might make, and they thought that that might have uh, made a difference to the war. Um, interestingly, the text of the declaration was airdropped uh, across Central and Eastern Europe uh, as well. Um, in December 17, uh, Britain occupies Palestine. That's a, I think that's Allenby um, in uh, the old city of uh, Jerusalem. And in that context, the best endeavours were internationalised. The best endeavours, I quote from the Balfour Declaration. Between 17 and 23, Britain's colonial hold of Palestine received international endorsement, first by the League of Nations, then at the San Remo Conference in 1920, where the British mandate for Palestine was formalised. It was confirmed two years later, again by the Council of the League of Nations, and was operational as of 1923. Here it is. What does the mandate for Palestine tell us? The, mandate, uh, the mandatory, that is, Britain becomes formally responsible for putting into effect the Balfour Declaration. Remember, I described the document as a, a, a very problematic piece of political literature. It placed the country under such political, administrative and economic conditions to secure the establishment of a Jewish national home. And it recognised the Zionist organisation as the public body for the purpose of advising and cooperating with the administration of Palestine, the British uh, colonial administration of Palestine, um, in order to establish the Jewish national home and to further the interests of the Jewish population in Palestine. Right. We're not seeing much yet in relation to the Palestinian population of Palestine, who at the time made up 90 percent of uh, the inhabitants. Um, the Zionist or, uh, organization, uh, again, citing from the mandate document, will take steps in consultation with the, uh, the government to secure the cooperation of all Jews around the world who are willing to assist in the establishment of the Jewish national home on what was at the time, of course, the national home of the Palestinian people. Um, in this context, um, the Jewish uh, uh, immigration to Palestine was encouraged, uh, but you know, importantly, as an afterthought, uh, the document um, ensured or sought to uh, ensure that the rights and positions of other sections of the population, that means the Palestinian Arabs, Christian, Muslim, non-religious, would not be prejudiced. Article 6, right? Article 6 and not Article 1, not the preamble. Quite interesting. Moving on, this is a British broker dispossession. It substitutes the Palestinian natives with the Zionist representatives. And this sets this framework apart from other colonial governments in the Middle East. The Palestinian Arabs were not given any significant positions of authority within the British mandatory system. Um, they were not given the right to create their own powerful autonomous Paris state structure, as was the case in neighboring uh, mandates. And it was, in fact, the Zionist organization um, that had received um, British endorsement to uh, manage local uh, affairs. The British mandate ends in 1948, three years after the war, three years after the UN uh, Charter. 
one year after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, what does it do? What is its legacy? It imposes colonialism long term. It denies Palestinian indigenous leadership. It replaced the native population with a settler population given priority in all aspects of life and suggested in the Peel Commission the partition of Palestine that was adopted in the partition plan of uh, the UN General Assembly in 1947. British troops and administrators left Palestine on the night between the 14th and the 15th of May 1948. The Zionist armed groups declared independence, as I said earlier in my presentation. Palestinians were displaced and the rest subordinated. Palestine, therefore, had had no possibility to decolonize. The structure of the mandate had been endorsed by the UN, and that included the partition and enabled Jewish supremacy in that land from that moment onward. However, Palestinian human rights have not gone away despite their denial. Instead, a new human right, the right of return, has become an additional entitlement since 1948 Nakba. And this, interestingly, is also based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I'll leave you with the, this thought and happy to take questions later on. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Alice. Um, yeah, hopefully we can have a good discussion at the end uh, to cover a lot. There's a lot, a lot of material and a lot of ground to cover, so we can uh, hopefully have a good discussion um, uh, at the end uh, further on on these issues. So next, uh, without um, too much uh, uh, ado, I'll uh, hand it over. Next, we have Miss Tamara Tamimi, and she uh, will speak a little bit about uh, ongoing settler colonialism. Uh, ongoing violations and accountability related to the related to that. So tomorrow, whenever you're ready. Thank you, thank you, Nakhil. It's uh, wonderful to be here with uh, all of you uh, today, uh, and um, uh, and um, uh, and uh, and uh, and excellent, very very important to host events currently on uh, Palestine, about particularly in light of what's happening currently, uh, there is the most recent uh, events. I will pick up roughly from where Alice um, uh, left off uh, today and will be speaking about Israeli settler colonialism in Palestine. And I pose the question, did the Nakba ever end? Did the Palestinian Nakba ever end? Yeah. In order uh, to do this, I will start by uh, speaking or outlining um, Israeli Zionist Israeli settler colonialism. Uh, Alice, of course, has had um, set a lot of the work in order uh, to do that here, and which I appreciate uh, a lot. But I provide a very brief uh, overview of Israeli settler colonialism. We see here on the right a map of Palestine and how it has gradually disappeared. I'll go through the different stages in my uh, presentation bit by uh, bit. This is the map of Palestine right before the partition plan that Alice has uh, covered. The green part is Palestinian land. The white part is uh, Jewish-owned uh, land. Uh, basically, Jews uh, at the time owned 7% of the land and through uh, mass immigration from the late 1800s as one of the main goals, as, Israel, as um, Alice has mentioned, of political uh, Zionism was, to, uh, was for um, European Jews to colonize uh, Palestine. So they uh, over some uh, 50 or 60 years, the Jewish population in the land increased to about 30%, but they still owned 7% of the land. Despite this, the uh, United Nations General Assembly, it allocated over 55% of the land to the Jewish states. That's the uh, white part you see here. 44% or 42% to the Arabic or Palestinian state and placed Bethlehem and Jerusalem under a corpus separatum that will be internationally administered. Now, before I 
uh, proceed with my presentation, I'll go one step back and share uh, and in order for us to understand all of this going forward, one thing that we need to see is that the ultimate goal of Israeli settler colonialism is to maximize the acquisition of land with the least percentage of Palestinians on, on it. And to that end, Israel, uh, Israel employs three main, uh, or Israeli settler colonialism has three main components. The first one is colonization. The second one is displacement. And the third one is segregation and domination. And to an order, and these uh, components, they correspond to four mutually reinforcing strategies. So for example, land takeover directly corresponds to colonization as the settlement expansion. The ethnic cleansing of Palestinians corresponds to displacement, uh, to the displacement uh, component, and the fragmentation of Palestinians corresponds to segregation and, domin and domination. And here we see that there are several key milestones that are very important to know in order to understand Israeli settler colonialism. The first one is the Palestinian Nakba in uh, between 1947 and 1949. The second one is the military rule years between 1948 and 1966. And then the last one is the 1967 war, which gave rise to the Israeli occupation and which serves as a pivotal tool of Israeli settler colonialism and apartheid, as I will demonstrate throughout this presentation. On the Palestinian Nakba, many of you might not know, but the Palestine, but Nakba has, is, is an Arabic word that has become um, part of the English uh, dict the dictionary. It translates essentially into the word catastrophe. It refers to the events that took place between uh, between November 1947 and May 1949, when at least 720,000 Palestinians and up to 1 million Palestinians, noting that the Palestinian population at the time stood at 1.4 uh, uh, million. So we're talking about if it is 720,000 Palestinians, we're talking about 51% of the population. If it is up to 1 million, we're talking about 72% of the, of, of the population. This population um, within the... Like we said, at least seven hundred and twenty thousand and twenty thousand Palestinians, they were forced forcibly displaced from their homelands and became refugees. They were prevented from returning to their homelands, and their property was expropriated. So here we see the colonization part as as covered by Alas, but also as enabled through the Nakba, the mass exodus and displacement of Palestinians and the prevention of the reversal of this colonization and displacement through the expropriation of property. Also during the Palestinian Nakba, 531 Palestinian villages were completely depopulated of its indigenous inhabitants. And by the end of the, uh, of the, uh, of the 1948 war, which extended into 1949, and with the uh, signing of the armistice uh, agreements, Israel had consolidated control over 78% of the land of historical Palestine, which serves as 44% more than the land allocated to them in the 1947 partition plan. If we look at this map here, the part in blue is the part that was intended to be the Jewish state. The part in purple here is the part that they took over, which was allocated to the uh, Palestinian state. In here, so we see in the Nakba all of the components of of Israeli settler colonialism. Uh, 
but the achievements of the Nakba were consolidated and amplified through the military rule that was placed on Palestinians who remained within the borders of the newly established states. When we talk about the military rule, we're referring to the years 1948 to the end of 1966. We are talking about a military rule that is based on the British mandates emergency regulations, which consists of 162 articles and, and which was on imposed on some 160,000 Palestinians. The military rule was essentially enforced by a set of military rulers who were stationed in Arab localities within the, within the borders of Israel. These military rulers had unlimited legislative, executive, executive and judicial powers. Now, one military, and of course, land expropriation was at the heart of the military rule against Palestinians. One particularly important military rule, and we're talking here about number 125, it prevented the movement of Palestinians into and out of and out of the designated areas, and sometimes within those areas. So Israel used this rule. Oh, come on, Nikhil, you'll give me a little bit more time. I still need some time. <laughs> I'll give you all the time after it's uh, after the, the other presentations. You'll have five minutes more just for yourself. <laughs> okay. Okay. Come on. Um... I, I, and so this rule was essentially used to expropriate Palestinian land by exploiting Ottoman and British rule uh, and British rules. These this uh, this rule it um, uh, restricted Palestinian freedom of movement, which prevented Palestinians from cultivating the land. Israel then used British and Ottoman rules to expropriate these lands that were uncultivated, basically, to in order to expropriate them into state land. But also the military rule against Palestinians, it gave rise to, it, it, gave, it, it enabled the basis to consolidate a system of apartheid, to demote Palestinians into second class or third class citizens even in their home, homeland. There were many restrictions on the enjoyment of rights and freedoms, but essentially three restrictions stand out in the collective memory of the people from the period of the military rule. The bans on movement which we've touched upon a little bit, bit, the prohibition on political organizations and the limitation on job opportunities. I'll fast forward into the 1967 war and occupation, one of the last important milestones in Israeli settler colonialism. It led to the occupation of the remainder of the land of historical Palestine, as well as the nice Sinai Peninsula from Egypt and the Golan Heights from Syria. It led to the displacement of another another 300,000 Palestinians, another wave of mass exodus we see here. It led to the annexation of Jerusalem, settlement, construction, and displacement of Palestinians. Now, this continues to be ongoing until today. If we're going to give some very small figures on the uh, matter, today there are, according to the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics, there are 151 settlements, there are over 100 settlement outposts, there are almost 720,000 Israeli settlers. This is the data from 2020. Uh, one, on colonization here. When we talk about displacement, we see that Israel promotes displacement of Palestinians or effectuates it through both direct dis displacement and the imposition of a coercive environment, which includes outlawing of communities, communities, house demolitions, revocation of residency, and imposition of restrictions on the registration of newborns in terms of direct displacement. In terms of indirect displacement and the imposition of a coercive environment, we talk about the availability of services and necessary infrastructure in Israeli controlled areas, such as electricity, water, functional roads, education, and healthcare, to name a few. Now, in order not to go over my time by, 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 by a long period of time, what is it that I want to say is that Israel has been ongoing in this, in the, in these measures of Israel, uh, of settler colonialism because they enjoy impunity, because there is a blank check that is given by Western countries to Israel in here. Whatever Palestinians do, 
essentially. Palestinians have used all forms of resistance uh, available at, disp at their disposal, both nonviolent resistance and armed resistance, all of which are, we are entitled to as people under settler colonialism uh, here. We, uh, we, we use uh, uh, popular resistance, we've used civil disobedience, we've used bilateral and multilateral negotiations. We used the strategy of internationalizing the Palestinian cause, particularly resorting to, uh, to the International Criminal Court. We used even, uh, we used all, we, we used boycott campaigns and all of these things were smeared and compromised by Israel to compromise on Palestinian resistance and in order to continue to advance Israeli settler uh, colonialism. When Palestinians use armed resistance, and here I would like to clarify that there is under no circumstances that I condone the targeting of, this, of civilians, in here, but even when we use armed resistance, there is a brutal attack on Palestinians. So in order to bring this circle around, we see that since the Israeli, um, that since the recent escalation in uh, violence, since October 7th, we see how Israel essentially has exploited these events in order to advance settler colonialism. We've seen in the first few weeks of the assault on Gaza, they said that Hamas is stationed in the north of Gaza, and so Palestinians in the north of Gaza should move to the south of Gaza. Now they're talking about continuously pushing Palestinians out of the Gaza Strip to enable its recolonization in here. We see them using the same strategies that were employed, for example, in Haifa by sweeping Palestinians south, uh, south, southwards to Sinai. The, the, the same strategies they used in Haifa in 1948 by sweeping Palestinians into the sea. But not only this, this genocide that we are actually seeing in Gaza, we are also seeing the advancement of Israeli settler colonialism in uh, and of course, through the uh, this gen this genocide and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in Gaza, we see it in unprecedented levels of violence, of destruction of property, of displacement of Palestinians. Almost two million out of the two point two million Palestinians in Gaza are now displaced. More than twenty thousand Palestinians are killed, and almost forty thousand are injured. But we're also seeing how Israel is exploiting the recent events in Gaza in order to advance the displacement and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in the West Bank. We're seeing unprecedented levels of violence and killing. Firstly, in uh, in several areas in the West Bank, but we're also seeing the accelerated displacement of Palestinians today uh, from uh, from key areas in. Uh, in the uh, West Bank, at least 1,500 Palestinian Bedouins in the Central West Bank have been displaced since October 7th. Additional and more alarming signs, we see the Israeli social media uh, engagement with Palestinians referring to which areas of the West Bank Palestinians will be ethnically cleansed from and telling them where the refugee camps in, uh, in Jordan will be. They actually draw maps in order to do that. So basically, the whole point that I am trying to make from all of this is that Israeli settler colonialism and the Palestinian Nakba persists until today. It is about time, and it is uh, and it is long overdue to see uh, uh, to to look at what is it that can be done in order to promote accountability and end Israeli impunity. Thank you, uh, Nikhil, for thank the additional you, time. Sure, no, thank you, Tamara, very much for that presentation and. Uh, as Spider-Man's father said to him, with great power comes great responsibility. And one of that, one of those challenges is to make, to, to come, to slam such a complex and multivarious uh, issue into a, a one hour discussion and a 10 minute presentation. But uh, thank you very much. Hopefully we'll uh, be able to discuss this a bit more. So let me uh, move it right along. And next we have Dr. Connell Mallory.
Hi, folks. Um, I, I feel terrible following uh, just two such excellent, rich presentations. Um, uh, and I, I could have listened to, to both Alison and Tamara all, all afternoon. Um, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you something completely different. OK, um, a week before the uh, the October the 7th events, uh, I, I'm at a conference in Cambridge uh, at the conference. It's on European human rights, which is my area. Uh, at the conference, um, Professor Conor Gerty, who's a professor of law at um, LSE, uh, gives a keynote speech. He's he, he plugging his new book, essentially. The book's on uh, imperialism in counterterrorism measures. Conor's one of the best speakers there is in the game. He's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and he gives this very rich and engaging speech. He's very, very charismatic. And everyone's just kind of nodding along. And he's talking about the relationship between imperialism and the Council of Europe, the European human rights structures, the European Convention on, uh, on Human Rights in particular. Uh, and he's talking about the history of imperialism being embedded into it. And he gets to the end of the talk and there's about five minutes left. And uh, like the rest of us, we all go over time. And so they're trying to wrap it up. And, and then Connor out of absolutely nowhere says, and imperialism is alive and well today, just on the borders of the region of Europe. It, 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 we can see it in uh, to a degree in Israel. And I think that it's time that we invited Israel into the community of European members in terms of their human rights protection. And so Connor's pitch was this, what if Israel were to become a contracting party to the European Convention on Human Rights? And it was just completely out of the blue. And given that it happened a week before everything else happened in Israel and Palestine, it was treated with a shrug of the shoulder. So, oh, oh right, okay, that's an interesting thought provoking thought, something that we forget about. But it's something that's stuck in my mind for the past five or six weeks. My, my research area is European Convention on Human Rights and in particular conflict and how the court in Strasbourg has dealt with conflict. So I thought, well, let's map this out and just see where it goes. Now, Connor's proposal of it was quite possibly just an entertaining way to end the speech. I'm not sure that he's advocating that in any real meaningful way, but it was an interesting thing. He, he based it on this. He based it on the fact that Israel as a, as a state has close European ties. It is part of social cultural fabric of Europe. It's part of the European Broadcasting Union, which means that Israel participates and has won the Eurovision Song Contest. It's part of sporting units as well. It, they compete in Eurobasket. They compete in the UEFA Soccer Championships. They, they can compete in the, the European Athletics. In a legal sense, the position of Israel in respect of Europe is that it is a, an EU trading partner, a very strong EU trading partner. Uh, and it's part of what, what the EU defines as its European neighborhood policy. So those countries in and around. It, it's also uh, the uh, running discussions and, and flying kites in the past, in recent decades has suggested that there, there's, there is a pathway to EU membership. In 2004, an opinion poll in, in, in Israel suggested that 85% of Israelis would support an application for membership of the EU. It was about 80% in 2011. The EU is Israel's largest trading bloc, and uh, it was the 24th trade partner for the EU in 2020. Now, that's all EU stuff. It's not Council of Europe stuff, so it's not European Convention on Human Rights things. But if you're a member of the European Union, you by and large have to be a member of the European Convention on Human Rights. To be a member of the European Convention, it's the Council of Europe. And the EU uh, ha and Israel has status there. It has status as an observer state alongside Canada and Mexico and the United States. It also takes part in the Venice Commission. Uh, and there was a period where it was Israel was floating the idea of joining the Istanbul Con Convention, which is a treaty uh, on the elimination of um, uh, uh, domestic violence, um, uh, which, which, which specifically um, allows for non-Council of Europe members to join, okay? Why is this interesting? Why, why might you fly this kite? Well, because if Israel was a state party to the European Convention on Human Rights, we could be looking at this conflict, or at least the discourse around this conflict that's taking place uh, uh, at the moment, through slightly different lens. Now, the lens at the moment is entirely driven through international humanitarian law. Is it proportionate? to uh, shut off all electricity, all energy, to shut off food supplies and to, with, uh, and to withhold aid coming through. This, this proportionality assessment is taken at an international humanitarian law uh, 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 level. Now that, that level is, is very, very specific where, the, the, where it's very well recognized that the primary objective is uh, of parties and conflicts is to win the conflict, okay? Human rights still exist during times of conflict. We're long past the days where, where, where people could conceivably argue that people's human rights stop during conflict. They don't. Now, how they are protected is, is, is certainly diluted. 
during conflict, but they do not end. OK, proportionality assessments are different. If Israel was a party to the European Convention on Human Rights, we would be discussing many of its policies through an entirely different legal lens on on, uh, on TV shows, in our media, in the newsprint, newsprint, we would have a different lens to this discourse. The European Court of Human Rights would be engaged to some degree. Now, it is good, and I mean good in a very tentative way at assessing things through conflict. It's not particularly great. What it is, is experienced, okay? Due to the conflicts that have taken place in recent decades and, and, and since the 19, 1950s on, on European territory, it's assessed forced displacement on a regular basis, whether it's in Northern Cyprus or whether it's in Nagorno-Karabakh, okay? There are cases that come out. There are principles that are developed. It, 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 it has developed guidelines that, could, that can be uh, realistically enforced. It's assessed indiscriminate bombing. The Russians in Chechnya, bombing of humanitarian corridors. The European Court of Human Rights is good at carrying out these assessments. It's assessed internment practices here. It's assessed torture accusations here in Iraq, conducted by British forces, um, in France, across the con continent of Europe. We have clear principles that are that are that, that can't be departed from on this basis. It's engaged with extraterritorial jurisdiction, where a state is exercising jurisdiction, exercising control beyond its territorial borders. All of these questions come, come to light uh, at the moment, as does military occupation, which I haven't listed. The European Court of Human Rights would be useful in the sense that interim measures may become a thing. And interim measures under Rule 39 at the European Court of Human Rights are a powerful tool when used appropriately and when not overused. But if you have a situation where you have people who are starving to death in a hospital or where you have electricity being shut off in a hospital, interim measures are, are exactly the type of situ situation where you have clearly identified individuals who will suffer a direct harm if, a, if a, a human rights violation continues. The European Court of Human Rights has imposed interim measures in extraterritorial settings. In the case of Al-Sadun and Mufti, the uh, European Court of Human Rights told the UK government, do not hand these two prisoners back over to the Iraqi government because they will face the death penalty. And it takes non-political assessments. It's a strategic actor. The court is pragmatic, but it takes non uh, inherently non-political assessments. It isn't contaminated by the politics that takes place at the UN. It isn't contaminated by the lens through which the ICC has to look at, thing, look at things and it gets discredited in that sense. So if Israel was a state party to the European Convention on Human Rights, we may be looking at this conflict in a different sense. I'm not trying to say for any any sense that it's going to be um, it's going to be better, uh, but it may shift the lens. The the ultimate thing is it would also promote a domestic rule of law, a prohibition on discrimination, and rights adherence on a more persistent basis, which hopefully prevents future conflicts. Now there are clear arguments against. Okay, I, I am mindful. I'm sitting up here in, in a court in Belfast, telling people in in uh, in Israel that it might be a good idea if they were a party to the European Convention on Human Rights. The notion of human rights imperialism spreads, steps to mind. Western Europeans saying, "Oh, look what we do so well. You should do it as well." It's it, it's a very very valid argument. But at the same time, whenever you look at some of the violations that take place, it it, it is it, it is it, it's a concern, and it's something that the the court itself has adapted to deliver. The court doesn't say that whenever uh, states are acting abroad, they have to fulfill all rights. It says they have to fulfill the specific rights to the situations in which they're uh, they're involved in. The other two things are are, are simply practical. The court itself would face a backlog. It would face very, very strong resistance in enforcing judgments, and it could cause political damage, okay? I'll say this, it's not gonna happen. The reason why it's not gonna happen is that in order to join the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, con uh, uh, the convention is open to signature to all members of the Council of Europe. It's pretty simple. You have to be a member of the Council of Europe. If you look at the Treaty of, the, the, uh, Treaty of London, uh, where it creates the Council of Europe, the statute of the Council of Europe, any European state, um, uh, which is deemed able and willing to uh, fulfill Article 3 may join. You, you essentially have to be a European state to join. So it's not going to happen. But, and I go back to Connor's point with this, at some point, we need to start thinking of more creative and more inventive ways in order to create better situations. I think our first two pre presentations have demonstrated how destructive international law has been in some senses to the situation in Israel-Palestine, not for the benefit of, uh, of, of either uh, of the parties. And so it requires thinking what if, thinking what do we do differently? Okay, and with that, I'll pass over to Luke.
Thanks so much, Connell. That was a uh, was uh, really interesting. Um, and last but certainly not least is Professor Luke Moffin. Hi, everybody. That's a sort of hard, hard acts to follow. Um, I'm really going to maybe situate things in terms of what has already happened and what uh, could possibly happen in terms of engaging with notion of reparations. Um, we've done a lot of work on this, and um, we've got a free database it's online that's got a lot of state practice. But I sort of want to situate um, the talk today, and you know, on Sunday, it's the 10th of December, it's 75 years on to the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the preamble itself, you know, the declaration came out of the horrors of the Second World War. And if you look there, the recognition is there about creating a world based on human rights and dignity. Um, because if we don't have this sort of protection, we end up condemned to people resorting to violence and brutality in order to get some sort of recognition um, and protection against tyranny and oppression. And we see this, we see this in conflicts around the world. Um, and so we haven't maybe lived up to the full potential of the Universal Declaration when um, so many people's rights, particularly in times of conflict and occupation, continually to be um, oppressed. Um, I think another starting point for where we think about reparations is um, something that came out of the First World War um, is was about the dispute, a dispute over a factory. But a fundamental principle of human rights has been this notion of remedy and reparations, that if somebody has a, a violation, if somebody has suffered harm, then international law, in particular human rights law, should ensure that people have their rights vindicated. And so reparations are a way of sort of wiping out that harm. It's almost like a magic wand legally that we talk about, that ideally we have a situation where we try to undo the harm. And when it comes to um, Israel and Palestine, these aren't new issues. Um, I think we could talk about reparations um, with um, the, issue of, the issue of reparations has been raised for the past 75 years. Ever since the Nakba, um, the UN has had a standing body that still exists today. Um, it's up to like its 69th report, where it reports every year on the extent of what it's tried to document and try to um, moderate claims. Um, so there's over 900,000 claims that were made since 1948 of people being displaced. At the time in 1949-1950, there was lands lost to the value of 100 million Palestinian pounds. Um, and I, I, calculation wise, I couldn't work out what that is today, but um, we're talking about tens of billions worth of land lost. Um, and these claims still sit within the records of the UN. Um, and I'll talk about the International Court of Justice in a minute, but in 2004, it cre the UN created a register of damage whereby it recorded further claims that occurred in the West Bank through the construction of the Israeli wall there. Um, and over 70,000 claims have been made to it. And up until about a year or two ago, 37,000 of those claims had been ruled as actionable. In other words, that you have 37,000 other Palestinians who have a legal claim um, for their loss of land or other violations of their human rights. Um, but I think in terms of how we think about the conflict, um, in you know Gaza um, and Palestine and Israel um, is the broader issue of a victimhood, but who's a victim, who deserves, um, and that's a constant fight. And I think with reparations, it's about fundamentally confronting the common humanity in each other, that everybody to some extent has suffered, some have suffered more than others, but how do you get back to going to a position of peace and moving forward? You need to recognize the harm and suffering that's been caused in the past. Otherwise the fighting just becomes um, cyclical and repetitive where collective victimhood of how one side victimized the other is constantly used to feed grievance and conflict. Um, and I think what we're seeing today is that international humanitarian law, um, as past speakers have spoken about, have failed. It doesn't protect civilians. Next year marks the 75th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions um, and it has failed to protect civilians. Um, it is not created for the purpose of civilians. It's created for the purpose of states um, to win wars. Um, and the issue of proportionality has been given too much of subjective account by the reasonable commander in the field that it papers over the protections that need actually to occur. Um, and fundamentally for civilians, they have no rights. There's no rights for civilians um, under international humanitarian law when it comes to them suffering violations. It's up to states to vindicate them. Um, and I think there's real space there for human rights to sort of speak to these issues. Um, not just to states, but also to armed groups. Armed groups like Hamas and others have human rights obligations. They control territory. Um, and 
we should be expecting that in any sort of uh, settlement, and this might be pie in the sky, that they should be responsible for making reparations for, you know, what has occurred is, you know, war crimes, crimes against humanity and potentially genocide. Um, and they should have obligations, you know, and face criminal sanction for that. And the same with the Israeli government. Um, there's going to need to be an accounting of what has happened. Um, because if we don't, we're going to allow it to occur again. And it's exactly what Tamara said, that there's this culture of impunity. <laughs> Um, what we do have coming up is another advisory opinion before the International Court of Justice. These are not legally binding, but it does set out the law. And in 2004, it extensively said that um, Israel has um, quite clear obligations for reparations, and that's why the Register of Damage was created then. Um, we could potentially expect another register to um, be created. There's been one created for Ukraine at the moment, but there's no point collecting all these claims if they're not going to be actions. You know, we need to actually move forward and to start making reparations. And this is going to require fundamental um, changes to be made around land ownership, about transformative of civil and political rights for Palestinians. Um, it requires more than money, effectively, in dealing with these sort of claims. So um, I don't want to say too much because we've really run out of time. Um, but I think, you know, reparations are something that's fundamental in human rights law. They're about vindicating victims as human beings, but they're also a way of encouraging those who've committed wrongdoing to face up to what they did in order to stop it happening again. Um, and colleagues um, in Ceasefire and, and Hema Abraham have put together a sort of like a data set of starting to map out how civilians have and haven't been compensated in relation to Israeli courts. Um, so if you're interested in looking at that, it's a really like um, interesting database in terms of how the courts have dealt with you know, victims' games or haven't dealt with them. So I think I'll leave it there and we'll have a few minutes then for questions. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, uh, Luke. And thank you again to all of our presenters. Let me see if I can um, get out of this screen. And let's see. Um, maybe, would you guys like to come up to the front in case there's any questions? I suspect there's a few questions. Sure. We'll take about, I think we have about five minutes for uh, probably two or three questions. I suspect there might be a few questions and comments out there. Um, maybe Tamara and Alice, if you guys would like to turn your cameras on, then we can get you into the discussion. Does anyone have any, any questions that you'd like to kick us off with? Yes, sir. I'll just uh, bring the mic over. Quick response to a request from Alice to uh, identify what particular uh, ICC crimes you might actually use against Israel. And in the classes I've been having, we had some discussion of this. And one of the interesting things is that you're much more likely to, in my view, to make progress under crimes against humanity for the very reason that uh, that uh, you have both uh, said that the law of armed conflict is absolutely dreadful in terms of actually doing anything. So uh, there, there are a couple of formulations in uh, the ICC statute, which I think should be focused on by those campaigning on this, not on uh, collective punishment, Collective punishment is not a crime, uh, so you, you can't do it. It's not in the ICC, but uh, there are things like, uh, where are we? Deportation or forcible transfer of population means forced displacement of the persons concerned by expulsion or other coerced acts from the area in which they are lawfully present. I mean, that's spot on. So why not just... Just do it. Take a case against Israel and and also try to prevent the international community having to pay for all the re all the rebuilding yes. uh, we need to, to get uh, to attack Israeli property and Israeli finances. They don't understand anything else other than. I think that a question was measures. 
Thank you for that question. Um, Alice, I think that question was directed to you, but I suppose since it bleeds into the subject of reparation, that might be even something that Luke, and certainly, of course, anyone else, if you have any comments on that. Alice, would you like to respond? Thank you very much, Tom and uh, Nikhil. I don't know whether in the interest of time, it's better to collect maybe three questions because there might be some overlap and then we can each uh, address the questions uh, one by one. Would that make sense? Yep, that sounds fine. Anyone else? Sure, one question up there. And uh, likewise, if anyone that's online wants to have a question, uh, just flag us, flag me down or feel free to pipe in. Thank you. I'm just an ordinary person here, but from what I observe, Israel will or has no intention of uh, listening to any law, any international law, simply because it has the backings of the US. It is the backings of the EU, and you can be forever more from 1948 to 1967 to uh, what is happening now, which is Nagba 3.0, if you like. Uh, the intention of Israel, as far as I can see, is to sweep the Palestinians to the south and totally destroy the infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm afraid I'm extremely pessimistic that Israel will ever be held accountable uh, in any form. They do not care. They've just got the backings of the international community. Uh, international, the ICC were very quick to uh, cite Putin, etc. But as regards citing Netanyahu or the Israeli cabinet, never. Thank you very much. One other question there. Hi, I think like it might be related like to the the first question, but like. Like any of you have considered like the option of like using universal jurisdiction, like considering like all the problems that have been like with international tribunals, like both in the criminal matters, but I think universal jurisdiction might be also useful like in civil matters for reparations. And especially consider that usually universal jurisdiction can be used as a way to get like individual accountability. Um, I don't know what is your opinion about like using it in this case. Um, like also there are some countries that have show some support to Palestine, uh, to Palestine and that probably have like universal jurisdiction, like Spain, I think they have it, like Argentina, I think they also have it. Some other countries in South America, some of them. But I don't know what is your opinion about like using universal jurisdiction? Thanks, Daniel. I think that's probably that's a good start for us. And I might use my own privilege as the chair to ask one additional question to Connell. Um, in particular, I was your discussion kind of uh, made me think about you were talking about how it might be perceived as, uh, you know, the, the notion of uh, Israel joining the European uh, Court of Human Rights as some form of um, Western imperial human rights being imposed uh, I was actually wondering if have you have you or anyone else considered the reverse aspect that it might be perceived as the sort of like the joining of the European community further in, uh, bringing Israel into the European fold and the European Court of Human Rights fold might be seen as a source of privileging uh, Israel over sort of the Arab world or the uh, Muslim world or the Palestinian community uh, Palestinian um, world uh, just kind of looking at from sort of that that very global south neo uh, imperial tropes that are all often put out there so i thought i'd just ask that uh, somewhat of a rhetorical question so i'll open it up to the our panelists to respond to these rich questions and then we can hopefully uh call it a day go ahead thank Alex, you. maybe you can start yeah shall i jump in uh thank you uh to um, everyone who um, had a question and uh, uh, especially to the chair's question there um, that that uh, echoed a question that I had for Connell uh, myself. Um, going back to Tom's uh, point, Tom, I think you and I are in uh, substantive agreement on um, this. And, you know, part of part of the problem is not only the infrastructure, of uh, international law when it comes to accountability for violations of uh, the laws of war, um, but it's also the politics. And this, you know, this echoes some of the other comments, I think the second comment in, uh, in particular that prevent um, the limited tools we have from actually being used in an uh, 
uh, effective um, way. Uh, you're absolutely right in terms of thinking about um, the catalogue of potential crimes um, set out in the Rome Statute for the, for the uh, ICC, uh, ICC more broadly. Um, and in fact, you know, there is there is a little bit of work um, which is happening in relation to um, the, I, I suppose we can call it like the flip side of the settlement enterprise. Now we know that um, in the discussion so far in um, the Office of the Prosecutor's um, agenda on the situation in Palestine, um, the settlement enterprise is listed as one of the potential areas um, that are being uh, scrutinized. This is, this is actually quite interesting. I mean, there's nothing to prove when it comes to the settlement enterprise. Um, in terms of facts, we have the facts there, right? We have over half a million uh, Israeli civilians which have been transferred from the, you know, quote unquote, territory of uh, Israel proper into the occupied um, East Jerusalem and uh, West Bank. We have clarity when it comes to international law um, and we also have clarity when it comes to the uh, international political uh, adoption of that particular understanding of uh, international law. And I'm referring to UN Security Council uh, resolution, is it 2334 of uh, December 2016, the, the, uh, the, last, the last thing that uh, Obama did before moving on, maybe the only good thing. Um, so there is a lot of potential actually to anchor any legal action on uh, the situation um, of the settlement uh, enterprise because there's nothing to prove. It's all proven and the law is absolutely clear. And you yourself, Tom, you know, cited um, you know, a number of passages within uh, the Rome Statute there. What the settlement enterprise does in the West Bank and East Jerusalem is that it drives um, the removal of Palestinians from particular plots of land which is slated for settlement uh, expansion. Um, you now I've been I've been working with the, the Bedouin communities for uh, over ten years, and that's you know that's one uh, example. But Palestinians in general across East Jerusalem and the West Bank are at risk of forced displacement to make way for the settlement enterprise. Um, and there are you know there are there are some some discrete parts of the Rome Statute that address the um, destruction and appropriation of um, uh, civilian property, not justified by military uh, necessity. Um, and of course, the display, forced displacement of uh, civilians. And both of these happen in relation to the settlement of, uh, enterprise. Both of these could be some really good uh, strategic entry points into um, the um, ICC. That being said, under the, 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 the vision or the partial vision of uh, Karim Khan, I think uh, this is going to be unlikely uh, for the moment, but we can, you know, we can try. Um, so, you know, happy to, happy to have a chat, Tom, uh, bilaterally, if, if you'd like to have, you know, have a bit more of uh, a conversation on, uh, on this and, you know, strategize moving forward. Hi folks, um, I'm mindful of time, um, uh, but what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'm going to quickly whisk around the other three questions and then I'll pass back to Nico uh, to see if uh, Tamara else have anything to add. Um, Daya, question on universal jurisdiction, brilliant. I, I think yes, I think this is coming down the line, but I don't. I just don't think that it's it's the time now, uh, not not during active conflict phases, but I, I, I do see uh, something uh, along the measure of a, a, a central or South American state um, uh, uh, saying something. Its implications will be very limited because, you know, it would be territorial jurisdiction um, uh, in order to enforce it, but um, I think that the political dynamics of it will be will be big. And we've seen, I think, Bolivia have already um, expelled the uh, Israeli um, Israeli diplomats. Um, uh, I, I know that there's another um, a, 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 a number of other nations who have done the same. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if it came down. And I think that it will be on the basis of some of the um, the language that has been used. Um, uh, from uh, um, IDF members um, in in respect to 
it, 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 particularly in the first fortnight of the of the conflict. But we, we, we've had things uh, time and again, referring to people as not as people but as animals, that type of thing. It's it's there is there there are um, crimes that can be uh, associated with this. So yeah, I, th I think so. Um, the gentleman with the question about the legality, I I, I think that's about. Um, Israel ignoring things and about it coming down to the power players, the EU, the US, I think it's a really, really important point. And I think that, that ultimately in time, I think some litigation strategies will be moving towards them. I, I know Alice is wearing a sign and many of others have signed um, letters calling on states to uphold their obligations under the Geneva Convention to condemn uh, um, uh, acts of genocide. And I think that that's, I think that there, there will be more legal pressure pushed against states who are seen as facilitating the uh, the ongoing conflict. Uh, I saw that the UK has said that it's uh, the MOD has um, uh, uh, is using uh, drones uh, in the search for the hostages. OK, I, I, and they're very clear. It's only in the search for the hostages. They're not assisting or passing on any of the data to um, uh, to anybody else. Th that's still it's becoming the, the closer that people get towards uh, towards um, com being complicit in anything that might look like a crime, I think we'll begin to see more and more uh, litigation. And, and I know that there's work being done by, by some of our colleagues in Glam here uh, about it. Nikhil and Alice, your point about human rights imperialism is absolutely spot on. Yeah, um, uh, I think it, it, it certainly works both ways. In, in the European Court of Human Rights context, and, and I, I, my, my book is on human rights imperialism uh, in an extraterritorial jurisdiction. Bit of a plug, folks, there. Um, uh, the 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 discourse has always been the state saying, "Oh no no no, we don't have human rights obligations here because if we were to uphold obligations pro prohibiting us from you know torturing an Iraqi uh, hotel worker Baha Musa who, who who was killed after ninety three separate injuries, oh it would be human rights imperialist if we if we said that we had human rights obligations here. That's been the discourse so far. It hasn't been in the Strasbourg sense at least. It hasn't been from states saying." Oh, we want to be part of the European Convention on on Human Rights, um, but but it, it would certainly it could look like a, a reward um, for it. Although I note uh, I saw the Irish News, uh, Irish Times carried a, a headline last week saying that that Israel was ready to to accept eighteen billion in development funding coming from uh, the EU Commission in, in any event. So, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, those lines and, and angles are being looked at anyway. Um, okay. Uh, Great, thanks. Uh, tomorrow, if you'd like to answer any of the uh, any or all of the questions that were presented. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Nikhil. Um, I, I want to add my voice to what Alice was saying about potential area, areas for prosecution within the International Criminal Court. And I also share Alice's pessimism on the current standing and approach of the uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. We've seen at the beginning, from the very early on, how the Palestinian uh, Palestine investigation has been deprioritized and other areas were, uh, were allocated finan ample financial resources and examinations opened into investigations and the um, the prosecutor opening um, uh, pro uh, investigations on his own uh, occurred. I think one of the questions talked about basically um, how Israeli impunity persists because it is supported by the US and the UK. And that's essentially what, uh, what why is it um, why it is important to promote, I think, South-South uh, solidarity to make use of, uh, of strategies such as the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. These are things that can go, that, that, that can, that enable uh, 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 a progressive people, whether in the global north, um, the progressive people in the global north to advance the Palestinian cause. That's number one uh, here, but also to promote South-South solidarity, perhaps in a manner, or to, or perhaps we should look into how is it that South-South solidarity can 
try to at least shake up the current dynamics, challenge the existing status quo in terms of the domination of the global no uh, the domination of the global north, basically, and and their hegemony over international law enforcement, essentially, uh, essentially and all of these uh, matters. I've diverged a little bit from what I wanted to say at the beginning, which was uh, adding my voice to what Alice was saying in terms of prosecution at the International Criminal Court. And I'll start with my negative view on the manner to end maybe perhaps on a more positive uh, note. I think one of the main issues, like when I'm now speaking in this event, but also through, through working on my PhD, the way that international law, it fragments issues and it's lack of, the, the lack of codification of the criminalization of colonization and settler colonization is problematic. Because if we want to think about what is it that is uh, about the prosecution of Israel and the International Criminal Court, you think, okay, for the West Bank, it's this. For uh, Jerusalem, also part of the West Bank, we can do this. For Palestinian citizens of Israel, it's that. For Gaza, it's this thing. For Palestinian refugees, virtually nothing can be done Essentially, so there isn't something that that works on addressing comprehensively settler colonialism as a crime. And this is my negative sense of it. But if we want to use what is currently existing in international criminal law, I would say that, yes, the settlement enterprise, as Alice has uh, said, is a very important part of the prosecution of uh, uh, the West Bank, including uh, East Jerusalem. But having said this, and I think there was another comment about how um, crimes against humanity might be more uh, uh, better uh, applied. I actually agree because for because it is only through crimes against humanity if there is any kind of political will at the part of the international com community or a strong prosecutor that doesn't have an inherent bias towards israel basically that we can bring some form of um of justice, at least a criminal justice, to Palestinians inside the green uh, line. I think also if we use the crime of apartheid as an over, uh, if, if we properly use the crime of apartheid, it might be one of the most, uh, of, of the crimes that is most relevant and most comprehensive in effectuating justice for Palestinians comprehensively and, and not entrench the fragmentation of Palestinians also through international criminal uh, justice proceedings in uh, here. I think the crime of apartheid, it will cover Palestinian, the, the second or third class uh, status citizen status of Palestinians inside the Green Line. There is a very clear form of apartheid in the West Bank, including Jerusalem. And the siege on Gaza, it can be considered, it can be tried both under persecution and apartheid. I think when we move forward, uh, a very crucial point in the uh, avenue of international criminal justice is to think about how is it that we can unite Palestinians and bring pal fragmented Palestinian components together rather than entrench this uh, fragmentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara, and thank you again, Alice. And thank you all for coming in, in numbers and those of you online as well and um, for this very rich discussion. Um, I second Claire's comment on the, uh, on the, the thread that we, I wish we had all afternoon to discuss. This certainly is not an issue that can be brought to a neat conclusion within an hour or an hour and 15 or even two or however many hours we would have, but at least we can have a discussion and um, find some sort of solidarity and solace in the ongoing um, madness around the world for lack of better word. Um, anyway, thank you all for coming and um, have a good evening.